Welcome to Double Deal, a series about organized crime in 20th century Boston. The stories of our central character, Richard Tchaikovsky. The criminals, the crimes, and the law enforcement officers who rule the streets. Nina and I will be your guides through the darkest streets of Boston, telling you the true stories of criminals, crimes, and lies. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening, as always. Today, we're going back in time to early 20th century Boston, starting with the days of the Camorra, also known as the Black Hand, and their activities. From there, we will be discussing the men who arrive from Sicily, beginning with Nazareno, Don Nene Teruso, and his brother-in-law, Giuseppe Don Pepino Modica. And don't forget my favorite Don of all, Filippo Bricola. You mean Prince Filippo Bricola, don't you? Exactly. From there, we will introduce you to the men they gathered around them. We will take you up to the point that Filippo returns to Sicily and Draymond Patriarca takes the driver's seat. The next week, we'll be covering Raymond's early years. So let's talk a little bit about the Black Hand. I'll be honest with you. I never really knew anything about the Black Hand prior to researching this episode. The Camorra has its roots in Naples and Campania and are still active to this day. The oldest written record is from 1735 in Naples when the organization was granted permission to open eight gambling establishments. Authorities believe that there are roughly 200 Camorra groups currently operating outside of Italy. The first time I heard of the Black Hand was in Godfather 2. Don Fanucci with his white hat and coat, he was vile. I always think of the extortion letters they'd send to their victims filled with their shakedown demands. Boston, too, had quite a few Camorra or Black Hand members. In January of 1908, a woman went to the police saying she received a letter demanding money. That same month, a merchant in the North End received a letter written in blood with a picture of a heart pierced with a stiletto knife, stating that if he didn't pay, he would be killed. In March of 1909, the Boston Globe ran an article about how Italian businessmen were receiving demand letters. Often there would be half of a business card in an envelope with instructions that a man would appear at their business with the matching half of the business card. The victims were to give the money to the bearer of the card. Others received letters telling them where to leave the protection money, such as in the crevice of a wall. The demands were astronomical for those days. One fruit dealer was told to leave $500. Think about that. Instead of giving the money, he went straight to the police. This was only a couple of weeks after a priest named Father Francis Liberty had been murdered by the Black Hand. Similar cases continued to be reported. Handwriting experts were brought in, but it was nearly impossible to arrest, let alone try anyone. There was even a report of how two Camorra members dressed as priests and one dressed as a woman hopped on a boat to Italy right under the noses of the BPD. Finally, in July of 1922, seven Black Hand members were brought to trial for the murder of Michael Scarpone. Scarpone was shot in the North End on January 20th. The trial lasted over a month. One defendant even went insane during the trial. The man who bragged of killing Scarpone, Joseph Simboli, was acquitted. Upon his release, a series of stabbings and shootings plagued the city. Simboli was found shot to death in his car in Orange Heights, East Boston, in October of the same year, and the letters continued to come. While the Black Hand was terrorizing Italian immigrants throughout the city, another group was moving in. The Sicilians were coming. By 1910, 74% of the population in Boston were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. The demographics continued to shift by the time my grandparents arrived. The North, South, and West End became known as the Center of Emergence. The native-born and German-born residents relocated to East Cambridge, Chelsea, Somerville, Watertown, Malden, Quincy, and Waltham. Nina, you mentioned to me that you noticed many of the men we're discussing today were selling produce or peddlers of one type or another. The second wave of immigrants, my grandparents included, wanted to avoid the factory regime. The successful ones went on to own their own grocery and retail businesses. They were true entrepreneurs. Something else I didn't know. Now, to our first founding father. Nazareno Don Nene Teruso was born in Monreale, Palermo, Sicily in August 1893. The name seems to be one that was handed down to the oldest son for generations. He arrived in New York City in April 1913 alone. He claimed an exemption from serving in World War I based on his alien status. He was still living in the same neighborhood in New York City and working as a chauffeur. I wish we could find a better photo of Don Nene. The one from his citizenship application is so faded. He was described as five foot, six inches tall, 150 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. Don Nene had a forehead almost as big as yours. Hey, I describe it as regal, but whatever. When did he move to Boston? 
By early March 1921, he was living at 347 Hanover Street in Boston. He applied for U.S. citizenship, but was denied. He was still unmarried. In June that same year, Donnene's sister arrived in Boston with her husband, Giuseppe Modica, and their newborn baby daughter. That brings us to another one of our founding fathers, Don Pepino. Giuseppe Joseph Modica, also known as Don Pepino, was born in December 1896 in Monreale, Palermo, Sicily. He married Donnene's sister, Giuseppe, in June of 1920. When he first arrived in Boston, he said that he was a barber. In the 1930 census, he stated that he was working in a soda fountain. But by the time of the 1940 census, he'd been naturalized and had his own fish business out on the old tea wharf. Now you're going to have to teach me something about my own city. What the hell was a tea wharf? The tea wharf was located on the north side of the long wharf. It was a T-shaped dock that was the center of the fish trade in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I think they shut it down in the 1960s. I didn't have any idea. Well, we both learned something new today. While Don Pepino was busy down on the docks, Don Nene got married to a girl with roots in his hometown, Josephine Sansone. He went into business for himself in fruit and tonic manufacturing. He moved his whole family, in-laws included, into a 4,000-square-foot plantation mansion in Lynn that had been built in 1830. There were 11 of them in the house in the 1930 census. The neighbors must have hated him. Well, I don't know if they hated him, but they certainly weren't too fond of the dogs he kept on the property. The neighbors were terrified of the German shepherds. In July of 1928, one of the neighbors finally went to the police. Don Nene had to appear in court. The complaint included that the German shepherds would chase the kids sledding in the winter, biting the milkman, the grocery boy, and the paper boy. Even the officer trying to serve the warrant was attacked by the dogs, after which they proceeded to chew the tires off his motorcycle. Don Nene was fined $15 in order to keep his dogs locked up. I know I shouldn't be laughing, but it must have been a circus. He was probably operating a still out back. His brother-in-law was caught bootlegging in 1924. The cops in Swampscott seized 16 barrels of wine, 36 quarts of scotch whiskey, and 30 gallons of Belgian alcohol, plus 2,000 labels. Joseph Gandolfo was fined $125. Well, I guess that qualifies as a bootlegger. There was another Don Pepino in and out of Boston at that same time that there's barely any information on. I was only able to find one news article, but he was also listed in several books and a Senate report on narcotics during the 1930s. Giuseppe Faella was known as Joe the American. In 1939, he was arrested in Paris with along with 40 others in a narcotics raid. The company he owned was shipping heroin to the U.S. and Mexico. The whole myth that the mob wasn't involved in narcotics is ridiculous. Look at the men we've covered so far in this season. The mafia was clearly involved in drug trafficking, not just at a local level, but an international level. I agree with you. There's, there's some romanticized fairy tale that there weren't any drug dealers, at least on a sanctioned level in the mob. Maybe the street guys weren't sanctioned to deal, but the bosses obviously weren't missing out on that market. No question. As for Don Pepino number two, we really weren't able to find much more about him. Very frustrating. Let's move on to a much more civilized affair, the Don with his own personal chef and chauffeur. The story goes that Filippo Brucolo shipped his own cook and her husband over from Italy to take care of him. This turns out to not be quite true. However, he did manage to hire a woman named Anna and her husband Vincenzo Travaglione. They had arrived from Naples about a decade before he showed up. In 1932, Anna opened up Mother Anna's on Hanover Street. I still remember the delicious manicotti. Yums. Once in a while, Dad would take me there for lunch when I was little. It's still open. Her grandsons operate it now. One of her other grandsons owns La Scala and Randolph. It's been there for like 50 years. Good memories of that place, too. Very good sautéed escarole. If I ever get ma back to Massachusetts, I'll have to try both of them. A little bit more about my favorite Don, Prince Filippo Brucola. Born in Palermo in August 1886, he arrived in New York City on the 9th of October 1920. Less than six months later, he moved to Boston. By 1924, he was ready to become a citizen of the United States. He never served any time in prison and only had one conviction, which was in 1923, for carrying an unlicensed revolver. He paid a small fine for that offense. I researched Filippo's surname, and it was included in the Registry of Noble Names in Italy. And he certainly had that air about him. Although only of medium stature, he was unquestionably the boss. We were able to find quite a good, good, few good photos of Filippo. He could have easily been mistaken for a CEO and always immaculately dressed. 
He was regal. I think he's your mob crush. I'm ignoring that comment. But Rishi had noble lineage too, right? Yes, but his grandma got knocked up by an illegitimate farmhand and lost her ranking, demoted to peasant status, and shipped off to a village far from her disgraced family. Well, you have more than a few of those in your tree, but I don't think Don Filippo ever lost his status. Let's come back to the Three Dons a little later. Let's introduce one of your favorites, Big Bozo Cortez. I can't even tell you how many years I thought Big Bozo was a clown. I can't. But I understand how a kid of your generation would equate Bozo with a clown. Hey, I was little, and the guys older than Dad were always going on about Big Bozo this and Big Bozo that. When my Aunt Helen would take me to the circus, I kept expecting to see him there, but no. So tell us about Big Bozo. Hey, did you know there was a little Bozo, too? I didn't see him at the fucking circus, either. (laughs) Poor kid. (laughs) Anthony Big Bozo Cortez was born on the 1st of August, 1909, to Angelo and Ellen Murphy Cortez in Boston. His father's family came from Messina in Sicily. Mom was Irish. His brother, Joseph, little Bozo Cortez, was born in 1913. He was charged with a gangland hit in 1941 and was on the lam for two years before being caught and receiving a short sentence. We'll get back to Big Bozo shortly. Forgive me, but Big Bozo wasn't really a looker. At five foot nine and 250 pounds, he earned his nickname. If you want to see a pic of him, check out the episode page on our website. Okay, now let's introduce Frank Cucchiara, Joseph Lombardo, Anthony Sandrelli, and Henry Salvatelli. I agree. Frank Chichi Cucchiara was born on March 29, 1895 in Salemi, Trapani, Sicily. He arrived in New York in May of 1913, then moved to Boston shortly after. Like Big Bozo, he lived on Hanover Street in the North End. He also owned the Purity Cheese Company. The best ricotta. <clears throat> used to come in this tall tin container with little tiny holes in it to keep the cheese dry. It would have some kind of like wax paper cover around the bottom and on the top, holding it all in place with an elastic band. It's like we're getting a personal food tour of Boston today. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a Cucchiara family in Salemi, Sicily that are still dairy farmers. It must be the same family as Salemi only has like a population of about 10,000 people. But Frank wasn't just making cheese. He was indicted for obstructing justice after the Appalachian meeting in 1957. Frank was arrested 12 times for a variety of offenses over the years, including possession of morphine and dynamite at the same time in 1925, assault, conspiracy, illegal lottery, and auto violations. Chi-Chi was probably the shortest of the bunch, at just a little over five feet, three inches tall. Portly would be a good description for him. But he was a sharp dresser. Don't forget, he once got picked up getting his shoes shined. Oh, yeah. Now, for the tallest on our list, Giuseppe, Joseph, Lombardi, or Lombardo, depending upon the source, was born in Salemi, Trapani, Sicily, just like Chi-Chi, but on September 1st, 1895. Since it appears he preferred Lombardo, which would be the right spelling, we will stick with that. He arrived in New York on May 18, 1906, along with his brothers Pasquale and Vincent. He claimed exemption from the draft in World War I because he had to support his parents. At the time, he was living in Brooklyn, but working in Manhattan. He didn't settle in Massachusetts until April 1927, but he was making frequent trips to Boston prior to that, including one in April of 1925 when he and Frank were arrested with the dynamite and morphine in a room in Brighton. He claimed he had inherited it when his brother passed away. What an inheritance. Lombardo had tried to bribe the cops then, but he turned, they turned around and added to the charges against him as well. The court fined him $100 for each offense. Joseph was arrested 16 times in total, but the only time he served in jail was six months in the House of Corrections for possession of a revolver. Arrigo Henry Noy Silvatelli was born on March 15, 1902 in Boston. I'll pass on giving a description of Henry. He had a total of 32 arrests, but only served one year in the House of Corrections. He and Big Bozo were arrested for the Livermore Falls Trust bank robbery that occurred on July 27, 1937. Livermore Falls as in Maine? I know, I know. All roads lead to Maine. Their getaway was great, though. They had brought tacks with them and threw them out the window as the cops were pursuing them, blowing out all the tires of the cruisers. Henry, Henry was described as a former nightclub owner. He was convicted of illegal alcohol sales on November 1, 1940. There was another brother, Gennaro Jerry Noy Salvatella, who was supposedly a stand-in for Henry when he was out of town. Now, tell us about the Canadian, who was also a sharp dresser with his pinky ring. 
Anthony Sandrelli was born in Canada on March 26, 1908. His parents were Serafina and Carmen Sandrelli. Carmen was also from Trapani. Serafina and her five children left Canada and moved to Boston in April of 1916. Carmen had stabbed another man he was involved in a turf war with. He was acquitted, but immediately after this, his store was burnt down. Carmen remarried and Serafina remarried. Anthony's first arrest was in 1931 for suspicion of murder. He also lived in the North End, but on Prince Street. And the Canadian was his boxing name. Weren't some of the others also boxers? Yes, Henry Noyes was too. A side note, Sandrelli was reportedly Henry Noyes' chauffeur in later years. And Salvatelli was Big Bozo's driver at some point. Cortez was arrested in February 1931 after a barroom brawl in Somerville at 2.30 in the morning. With him was Anthony Sandrelli. The two of them were soon cleared, however, and back out causing trouble. They were all connected to each other, either in the ring or in the street. For sure, but tell us who was managing our boxers. Both Sandrelli and Salvatelli were being managed by Don Filippo. It's interesting because Filippo worked closely with Dan Carroll, who was a boxing promoter. One of Carroll's boxers was Stephen Gustin. His real surname was Wallace. He took the name Gustin because it was the name of the street where the gym was located that he trained at. He and his brother Frank were members of the Gustin gang. It seemed that Don Filippo was recruiting soldiers out of his stable of boxers. No question. We mentioned earlier that Don Nene and his in-laws were into bootlegging, but they weren't the only ones. Joe Lombardo was called a rum baron by the newspapers. Lombardo had an office on Hanover Street where he was running numbers and selling alcohol. The name of the firm was C&F Importers. It was not registered with City Hall. His, partner, his partners were allegedly Frank Cucchiara and a man named Salvatore Kengemi. Both men were from his hometown of Salemi. In late 1931, the Gustin gang hijacked $50,000 worth of liquor from Lombardo and hid it at a summer home in Nantasket that supposedly belonged to a Harvard professor. They contacted Lombardo and told him to pay up. Rather than pay, Lombardo tipped off the cops who seized the liquor. Shortly after that, the Gustin gang and Lombardo agreed to a sit-down. Steve Wallace warned his brother Frankie not to go, but Frankie didn't listen and went anyway. According to the authorities, Frankie Wallace and Bernard Dodo Walsh, Timothy Coffey, and some other gang members drove to the North End at about noon on December 22, 1931. They parked their car on Parmenter Street, and headed to Joe Lombardo's office at 317 Hanover Street. But it didn't work out the way they thought it would. It was an ambush. Frankie Wallace staggered into the office of attorney Julius Wolfson. He dropped his empty weapon at the doorway. He made his way through the room and collapsed into a chair. He leaned over on his left side, his head resting between the legs of the, his legs on the floor. In that grotesque position, he died. There's a picture of it on the website. Forgive my flubbing and my voice there. The link is in the show notes. Walsh's body was found on the second floor landing of the stairwell. The bullet which killed him entered his chest on the upper right side, passed through each lung and the heart. According to the autopsy, death was necessarily and rapidly fatal. There was no evidence that the weapon, a thirty-eight, was held in close proximity. And what happened to Timothy Coffey? Coffey was discovered crouched behind a chair, which was behind a screen in the attorney's office. Coffey had assisted Wallace into the office and then hidden himself while another member of the Gustin gang threw Wallace's empty gun out the closed window into Hanover Street, where it landed at the feet of a pedestrian. That man then went to the secretary's desk and tried calling the cops. He hung up the phone, placed his gun in the desk drawer, and quickly exited the crime scene, disappearing into the chaos. Arrests soon followed. Cortez and Noyes were both arrested at a shoeshine shop on Hanover Street on December 26th. The arresting officer later testified that he said to Noyes, I want you. Noyes said, I expected that. The cop said then that he noticed Cortez and said, I'm going to take you too. Cortez was believed to be Noyes' chauffeur and bodyguard. Noyes intervened and said, give the kid a break, you've got me. The cop retorted and said, misery likes company. He then frisked Cortez and found three fully loaded pistols on him. One of them was cocked but had the safety on. Noyes was unarmed. Well, of course Noyes would say that about Cortez. He had three guns on him. Well. Cinderella was picked up loitering in the corridors of the courthouse on the 28th of December. He must have been waiting around for Noyes and Cortez. On Thursday, December 20, 31st, Joe Lombardo surrendered himself to the police. He entered police headquarters at 4 p.m. accompanied by a bodyguard. 
The bodyguard was wearing a top coat that barely reached his knees and a tattered cap over his eyes. He left Lombardo as soon as he was safely ensconced in the police superintendent's office. When the superintendent arrived in his office, Lombardo quietly stated, I don't want you to think I'm being sassy, but I'm not going to answer any questions. In response, the superintendent stood up and opened the door. Lombardo was taken to the third floor, fingerprinted, and photographed. His last photograph had been taken by the police in 1925 when he and Frank Cucchiara were arrested for possession of narcotics and dynamite. Lombardo still refused to answer the barrage of rapid-fire questions that came his way for 30 minutes straight from the six officers surrounding him. He kept his word. The police finally gave up and transferred him to a jail cell at the Hanover Street Police Station to await arraignment. The following evening, Frank Cucchiara and Salvatore Cangemi surrendered themselves too. They were booked, fingerprinted, measured, and photographed. They too requested counsel and refused to talk. A grand jury was convened in January 1932. The charges were dismissed against Salvatelli, Big Bozo, and Anthony Fauci. No, not that Fauci. Sandrelli had been cleared in December, but Lombardo, Cucchiara, and Cangemi were still being held. The judge ruled that the medical examiner did not have the expertise to make a judgment on the forensics, which was still pretty primitive in those days. There were bullet holes in the furniture, the walls, and in the windows. It was unclear who shot what and when. Big Bozo wasn't free to go, though. He had a prior gun charge and disorderly conduct charge that he was granted a suspended sentence on. In April, he was sentenced to two and a half to three and a half years in state prison. On March 21st, 1932, Lombardo, Cucchiara, and Kangemi were freed from Charles Street Jail as the grand jury was unable to return an indictment. No one was ever tried. At the time of the Gustin gang killings, there were 11 gangland slayings that year. It would be another 30 years until the McLean-McLaughlin War would erupt. But over those three decades, there was no shortage of tension or violence between the competing factions. Okay, back to my favorite, Don. It was believed that Don Filippo was in control of organized crime in Boston and most of New England from 1932 to 1954 when he returned to Sicily. During his time at the top, he was more than just a boxing promoter. He was the owner of the Wonderland Racetrack in Revere, Mass., and owned racehorses. Filippo was also a hero. He sued the IRS for falsely claiming he had undeclared income, and he won the case. In 1951, he acquired a large interest in an olive oil business in Italy. By 1954, he moved back to Sicily, but returned to Boston sometimes several times a year into the 1960s. Rumor was that he was still pulling the strings, even in his so-called retirement. Brucola was also said to be a very fair boss. Whenever there was a sit-down over someone or their conduct, he always allowed the man to be present regardless of his rank. The man would also be given a chance to represent his side of the story. Definitely a good leader. Did you have someone else you wanted to introduce? I want to introduce one more of the old guard, Giovanni Johnny Williams Guglielmo. Born February 9th, 1913 in Rivera, Mass., he was the youngest of the gang. But he continued to run Brucola's gambling interests after his return to Sicily. If you listened to last week's episode, you might remember that Ralph Lamatina worked under Johnny in his early years. Johnny did not have a lengthy record, but he did have two convictions, both of which resulted in prison sentences. The first was in February of 1934 for passing counterfeit bills. He received an 18-month sentence in Lewisburg. The second was in January of 1941 for assault with intent to rob. He was given a five-year sentence for that offense. Most of his business interests were in vending machines and jukeboxes. And he owned the Hotel Capri in Havana. We'll be doing a bonus episode about Havana after the first of the year. Johnny's influence would extend well into the 1960s. In Howie Carr's book about Johnny Moderano, he says that Johnny's father sent him to Williams to set him straight. Williams was living at the Bostonian Hotel in the Fenway. He would spend his afternoons in the hotel lounge drinking anisette. The little lecture didn't work. Well, at least he tried. Anthony Sandrelli continued to be a presence in the Boston mob scene. He worked directly for Joe Lombardo running the numbers rackets in the area. Sandrelli was picked up by the police for questioning for almost every murder that occurred in the Boston area well into the 1960s. Don Pepino owned a small business called the American Finance Company on Hanover Street in the North End. He managed to keep himself from being arrested all of those years, but his lending endeavors didn't always go well. He lent $5,000 to Joseph Rizzo on the okay of Tommy Three Fingers Brown Lucchese, but he never saw a dime of it back. 
Kukiara continued to run Purity Cheese, but he also continued in the narcotics trade. He was listed, along with other heavyweights, Russell Buffalino and Santo Traficante, as controlling the drug flow of narcotics into the U.S. from Europe, Mexico, Cuba, and Canada. And then, of course, there was the Appalachian meeting in 1957. Well-dressed wise guys running through the woods. Maybe we'll do a bonus episode on the Appalachian meeting if people are interested. That would be a fun episode. Now, did you know that Patriarca was bought in for questioning shortly after Appalachian? When Ho Special Agent Homer Wilbur asked him why he wasn't there, he responded, why should I be there? There was a meeting for Sicilians, and I'm not Sicilians. While the old-timers were ruling quietly from behind the scenes, Raymond was dreaming of his own rise to the top. In our next episode, we'll be discussing Raymond's rise to power. His sidekick, Ben Tilly, will be making an appearance again. You might remember Tilly from his brief appearance in Episode 1 with Richie's mentor, Jack Kelly. Our teaser about Ben Tilly for later in the season is Revenge by Robbery. If you want to know how that plays out, then you'll have to keep listening. And our old school dons will be popping up again. Thanks, everyone. Please follow us and share with your friends. Bye. Bye. Double Deal. True stories of criminals, crimes, and lies.